Hello everyone, welcome back to Soccer 60 where we talk about the youth football industry and bring in a panelist to talk about the industry in the whole. All right, Soccer 60 is on its fifth episode right now, so thank you so much guys for supporting us this far. Um Towards the end of the show, we will be answering some of your questions uh, from you guys from Instagram or Facebook. So don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms at Little League Soccer MY. In this podcast, your usual culprits are myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston. And today, we have head coach of Little League Under 14s, FCKL Girls Under 13s, and Boys U 14s, Simon Mortica. How are you doing, guys? Very well, thank you, Henry. Simon, good. you good? Yeah, I'm all good, thanks. All right, we've, we've seem to have quite an eventful weekend. Uh, it's been a very, for me, it was uneventful, uh, which was a good break for me. How did your weekends go? So, so, so we seem to have had an eventful weekend, but for you, it was uneventful. That, that to me is an eventful weekend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've, had, I've had a very lazy weekend, if I, if I were to say myself. Really? Yeah, I've had a very lazy weekend. Eating donuts? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Would you like to tell the story at the start, Andy? <laughs> well, I was going to let you off of this one, but since you brought it up, for why not? The listeners out there who might be interested in uh, Henry's horrendous eating habits, I, I bought him <laughs> yesterday a box of donuts, um, and I'll I will add that the box of donuts contained twelve donuts. Um, he had done a little bit of extra work for me over the weekend, so I thought I'd reward him. And I find out this morning that he's only got two of the 12 left. Uh, yes. So 10 donuts consumed in 12 hours. And one day we are going to do a nutritional podcast um, <laughs> and we'll address why that is a bad idea for all those youngsters out there. Because I don't want any of our younger uh, or maybe the 16 year olds as well listening and thinking, oh, Henry ate. 10 donuts in 12 hours maybe i can do the same thing no it's a bad it's a bad idea and we'll tell you why one day yeah. we'll tell you why one day but bef- <laughs> but before we tell uh, before we tell you why or even decide to go into that um topic uh andy why don't you keep us in check with what's happening with little league this week yeah, so um, as much as I take the mick out of you for, for saying that it's been an uneventful, eventful weekend, actually for me it has been quite busy. I've um, mm-hmm. got a lot of things going on this week, so just to run you through a couple of the things, we've got um, our Little League uh, training sessions, which we've been doing every Wednesday as a free trial. We've moved those to Thursdays, so look out for that this week. Get on there, give it a free go. Coach Nidal again will be taking you through 30 to 40 minutes of, of free workout. Get on there, have a go, try it out. Um, this week is also the last week to order your special Whiteout Edition t-shirt. Um, it's a fantastic design. We've got four different designs for you to choose from, whether you're supporting uh, one of our four centers. Um, 50% of the proceeds from that go to support the COVID-19 fund in conjunction with Mercy Malaysia. So you're doing some good for the community as well. Um, We have also included a little segment on our website. It's a Little League 30 moments from the last five years. Um, Some fantastic pictures up there. For those of you that have been with us for for some time, do get on there and have a look. You'll have a a journey down memory memory lane from some of the places that we used to train, some old tournaments, um, some old friendly matches, um, inter-club friendly matches. It's, it's, It's quite... It's quite interesting to look back and see how far we've come in those last five years. Um, And I think people are really enjoying that. We've had a lot of people check it out so far. So if you haven't checked it out yet, get onto littleleague.com.my and and give that a a look. Um, Another thing that we've done this weekend is we've launched a brand new football club in Singapore. So this has been um, a project we've been working on for for six months now, I would say. Um, Yeah, four to six months. Uh, And we just launched it over the weekend. Um, It's a project called Island City Football Club. It replicates um, what we're doing up here in KL. Um, If you're interested and you're in Singapore, do go and check that out because I think that that's going to be really interesting to get part, get involved with over the next uh, few months. Um, It's uh, got some great coaches on board for it. Um, it will be an extension to our little league program down there that we spoke with with Paul on a few weeks ago. Uh, so do have a look at that. Finally, the most exciting news is we have got Soccer 60 mugs. Oh, yeah. Soccer look 60 mugs. And <laughs> I do apologize for anybody watching this. Uh, if you see me drinking, you're going to see me drinking out of a picture of myself or on the other side is a picture of, of Henry. So I do apologize <laughs> for that. But... <laughs> Uh, our producer of the show um, did mention that he was a bit fed up of seeing me drink out of my 
horrendous collection of cups at home so he, he sorted these out for us so hopefully you enjoy those if you're watching it on the on the youtube channel if you're uh listening to it on spotify or, or apple podcast then it won't affect your listening at all apart from this <laughs> pointless story that i've just thrown in um <laughs> But uh, that's 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 the news. As always, you can um, catch up with any stories on littleleague.my, our website, or follow us on, on Instagram um, and Facebook pages as well. So that's about the news for us. All right. We will move on to the very first segment. Now, this is going to be very interesting because I think Andy put up a challenge last week because Cash gave a compelling story about her kit. Uh, Simon's got a Little League kit on, but he's going to tell us a different story from what I've heard. Simon, explain your kit in, in your way because I, I'm sure that's not the one that you want to wear. No, it, it wasn't the one wash, I, I wanted wash, to wear. Washing machine was broken. Yeah. <laughs> so, <it was. laughs> so basically, I would have been wearing, my choice would have been a Liverpool shirt. And the reason for it is because um, quite a few years ago, uh, when Match of the Day used to do the Goal of the Month competition, um, and you used to text in, to um, choose which goal you thought was the best goal of the month. So on one particular occasion, I did it. Um, the goal, if I remember rightly, was um, it was a Wayne Rooney, Rooney goal at Old Trafford. And the only reason I picked it is because it was very similar to an Eric Cantona goal. So I picked it, I texted in, and then a week later, I got a phone call saying I'd won the goal of the month competition. Um, and basically, what happened was you got to choose um, to go to the club of your choice and you won two tickets to go and see the, the game live. Um, so what happened was at that time as well, after I won the competition, um, TV shows started to get investigated about the call in and the text in and the charges for it and things like that. <laughs> so I had to wait for months for this, for this prize. So he eventually called me back and said, uh, one of the games that you've chosen was Liverpool versus Arsenal at Anfield, so we're going to send you to that game. I was like, brilliant. And they said, also, because you've had to wait so long, we're going to send you a Liverpool shirt as well. And um, they sent me a cheque as well, which was great timing at the time. So I was just moving into a new house as well, so it paid for half my sofa as well at the same time. <laughs> they paid for half the sofa. They've, yeah. they've given you a monetary compensation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> plus two tickets to the game, plus... Plus a Liverpool shirt. Where's that my, jersey now? Where's that kit now? Uh, at my parents' house in the UK. <laughs> my my immediate question is how expensive was the text in to yeah. cover those costs? <laughs> <laughs> they must no wonder they compensated you. <laughs> I think it was a pound, one pound, I think, the text. I, I also think it's quite <laughs> ironic winning Liverpool tickets for voting on a Man United goal. Yeah, that's yeah, what I, I was know. about to say. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that would have been my story behind the Liverpool shirt if I was wearing it. What do you think, Andy? Was it an interesting story enough to beat Cashes? It was a very interesting story. Um, I, I, I doubt and question one part of the story, and that is the, repa- uh, the, the part where you had to text in. I, I believe back in Simon's day when he was watching Match of the Day, it would have been a letter written in. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. I, 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 don't think, I don't think we want to reveal, uh, we want to do an H reveal now, right? Um, no, not, not yet. That, that being said, it brings us to the best uh, transition that we can ever ask for, which is the introduction to Simon's coaching story. So, Simon, just why don't you give us a background of yourself and how yourself, you got yourself into football? Um, into football, it was like I've been involved in football since I was very young. Um, it started with my, my, my dad used to play football a lot, so it was basically going onto the back garden and kicking a football around with him. Um, and the, the first kind of experience I had with uh, junior football was, uh, and my dad likes telling this story, I was um, nine years old. And, uh, well, obviously, because I'm old back then, it was like under 11s and upwards. Where, okay. and it, so like today, you go a lot younger. Back then, it was like under 11s and up. That was it. Hmm. So I was nine years, eight, nine years old, and my dad took me to a, a trial training session for my local junior football. And... Um, took me up to the coach and said, oh, I brought him for the trial. He said, how old is he? I'm, he's nine, or he's a little bit young for this. Um, he said, oh, well, can he just train with you? And I was like, yeah, sure. So at the same time, my dad's friends were playing on the pitch next to us. So he said, I'll be back in five minutes. I'm just going to see how the, how the guys are going on. Fair enough. So off I go training. And um, literally, my dad said, within five minutes, the guy walks back up to him, taps him on the shoulder, 
shoved a form in his hand and went, sign that. And my dad said, I thought you said he was too young. And he said, well, what do you feed him on, raw meat? He's running around <laughs> kicking everything, won't leave anybody alone, sign it. <laughs> so that was my introduction to junior football. Um, and then from then on, I, I, I uh, managed to play for uh, Doncaster Rovers for two years in the youth academy. I represented my county and played non-league football. Um, so that was my journey into playing. And did your dad sign away your rights on that piece of paper when you were nine years <laughs> yeah, old? Yeah, I don't know if he got a signing on fee. I don't know what it was. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty, I, I don't think when I was playing at nine years old, I don't think there was any forms to sign or anything like that. I think, I think someone's had your dad then. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so uh, we, we talk a bit more about your playing career. Um, you played in non-league. Could you give us the name of the league that you played in? Um, the, the sort of highest that I got, obviously I, I've been at a youth academy for two years, but I played in the, back then it was called the Unibon Premier Division. So it was the one just below the Vauxhall Conference at the time, um, going quite a way back now. Mm. So, <laughs> again. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but Andy remembers it because he's nodding. So <laughs> that, that was just to be polite. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a so after your playing career, you decided that it wasn't going to be the first choice uh, to coach to to transition smoothly into coaching. You did other jobs first, but um, what was it that you did, and what made you decide to go into coaching? I know you had a story for it. Yeah, well, basically, um, I used to my full time job was um, an engineer. I used to work for. Um, like Sky TV and Virgin Media and things like that. And um, I had to stop playing football due to working a lot of weekends. So full-time job came first. So when I was playing, coaching never really entered my mind too much. Obviously, when I was getting older, um, I started to look at the game a little bit differently and the managers that I was playing under and the players that I was playing with. But it never kind of entered my mind too much. And then when I stopped playing, um, there was a moment uh, that came up in my life when I when I got divorced, and that was a moment when I kind of thought to myself, "Okay, what is it I want to do now?" Uh, football had been a huge part of my life, like I've said, since I was a young young kid. Um, I'm really passionate about it, and I, that was kind of when I just sat down to myself and said, "Right, um, I'm going to go into coaching um, and see how far I can get." And and basically, it was just you going, yep, I'm just going to get my badges and then start from there. I remember I decided I was going to do it. I remember going to see my parents and they were sat on their back garden on a nice hot sunny day, which is unusual for the UK. Um, and, I, and I told them that I was going to go into coaching and they were like, oh, OK. And then when I said the full time for half part, their eyes kind of widened and went, oh, really? Do you know how difficult that's going to be? I was like, yes, but I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, so the initial plan was just to volunteer at, at local junior football clubs and take um, and start the journey with my coaching qualifications. So how did you get into Rotherham's academy? Um, basically, oh, sorry, sorry. Just, just just before we go on that a little bit, like wh- what? How old were you when you made that that decision to mm. to go and pursue it as a full time path? Thirty three. Thirty three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's hear about Rotherham. Yeah. Yeah, so when I decided to go into it, um, I was talking to a guy on social media and Twitter, and he lived in the same village as me, and he was already involved at Rotherham, and he was also doing coaching a, a no, junior football club at the same time. So we got talking. I explained that I was going through my qualifications, and he said, you're happy to come down, and you can coach my boys to get experience for your qualifications. So didn't know the guy at all, so I thought it was brilliant. So I ended up going to meet him, took some training sessions for his team, and then we got talking that he was at Rotherham United. Um, so I asked if I could go down and watch training sessions, uh, which they said was no problem. So it wasn't direct with the with the youth teams then, it was just like the, the lower, a little bit like I set up with the Little League at first. I was watching those kind of sessions and things like that. Um, and then as time went on, and they kept asking me to come down and I kept I kept going um, and eventually just uh, they came up to me one day handed me the the kit and went we want you to we want you to join us and 
it started from there. Oh, no forms this time, yeah? Yeah, no form this time. <laughs> 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 now, it didn't take long for your coaching career um, before you decided to move abroad. Um, why did you decide to pack your bags and just head somewhere else, not, not in the UK? I think when I looked at coaching in the UK, it was... It was very, it's very difficult unless you're really, really high level and to get into full-time coaching. I mean, even, even, even then in, in the championship, you know, uh, youth academy coaches, there's still probably a large majority are part-time. It's mm. really probably Premier League where you, you get those opportunities for, for full-time work. And when I decided to get into full-time, wanted to get into full-time coaching, I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to go abroad so you could I could gain more experience and coach pretty much day in day out. Mm, mm. So that what it was, was the, it, what what was the transition like from going to work? I, I'm assuming being an engineer was a nine to five job Monday to Friday, was it or or not? No, it was it was mixed. It was I would work at the weekends as well. So so what was it like going from that that kind of job into uh, pursuing a a full time job in being out on a football pitch? Um, very different. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, it's like I said, something being involved in football since a, since a kid, and then wanting to wanting to do it full time coaching. It, like I say, it was very different going from full time work into into that environment of coaching. Um, took a little bit of time to adjust to it, um, but I think because it, it's something I'm really passionate about and driven about, it, it, I just I just went for it. Any more, Andy? Uh, no, that was just just curious as to you know, once you make that decision, that's that's a pretty big decision. It's a bit like uh, how yep. we were speaking to Cash last week. She mm. she was she had done law, and then all of a sudden she goes into into football and into the business of football and turns that into a full time career. That's a a massive um, change of life path. And yeah. you know, obviously Simon had actually got out into the into the world and and been working as an engineer before he then transitioned into into football. So it's mm. it's interesting to see how people um, make these decisions, why they make the decisions, and then how that leads to the to the rest of the career for them. So yeah, uh, exactly. And and I think it takes a lot of um, effort in terms of your mental strength or your personal um, how you say your personal push uh, in terms of getting yourself out of that comfort zone and even going abroad to get work uh, in, I, I, in, the, I think, in the industry. I think as well, like I hope people see that to, to, to realize like how much passion these guys must have to do that. I mean, you know, if you're a, if you qualify as a lawyer, how many people give up being a lawyer to go and be a, a football coach? Yep. Um, same thing with an engineer. You qualify as an engineer, work as an engineer for a period of time and then decide to go and be a football coach. There's only one reason you make that decision and it's through the passion of the sport. So, yep. you know, I think that that's, that's a really interesting angle to look at and, and people should should look at that and understand the passion that these guys have and yep. and, uh, and and really appreciate um, what kind of efforts they're putting into this, this job now. Yep. I think a lot, of, a lot of people would have um, other opinions on on why people go into football coaching. So mm. it's kind of interesting to see when people have have done it around a bit of a slightly unorthodox way um, as to what their experiences are. Speaking of unorthodox, we go into uh, the next topic, which is venturing into Asia. Um, Simon, so you have a very interesting way of getting your jobs abroad. Uh, that's for for all I've found out. You know, knowing you for this this long, um, but I like to I like you to tell the listeners how you got yourself down here working in Asia, um, the Middle East first, and then in Asia. So let's talk about the Middle East. How did you get yourself get involved there? How did you get yourself involved there? Well, it was Asia first, and then then the Middle East after. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, yes. I, you're right. I, I I explained that to Henry on our <laughs> briefing for this show, and he, of course he's got it wrong. Did, oh, sorry about that. Hey, it's give right. me. I, I think I think it's the first mistake I've done in three episodes. So, <laughs> <laughs> are you sure about that? Hush, hush now, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> if but I start let's get talking back to about that. your mistakes, we'll never talk about Simon. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about Simon now. Uh, Simon, so Asia first. Then, how did you get yourself down here? Well, it was basically because I was starting from scratch. Um, I had no no network at all. I didn't know many coaches in the field outside of the UK. So 
it was how am I going to be able to work abroad? So it was basically talking to coaches on social media, uh, whether that be Twitter or LinkedIn. It was just getting to know people, just initial conversations at the start, just to talk about football and coaching. Um, and then obviously sometimes you would go into if there were any opportunities. Um, and that's how I found out about the opportunity in Malaysia the first time. It was just by that process um, and got the details for the academy, sent uh, my CV um, and then a couple of Skype calls. And then it was decision time, basically. Um, and For them or you? <laughs> <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> Um, so then it was, it, I made my mind up and just um, said, let's go for it. Uh, what's the, you know, what, you're thinking about, um, is it the right time? Is it the right one? Um, but I remember one of my friends just looked, turning to me and saying, well, what's the worst that can happen? You go out there, um, if it doesn't kind of work out, you, you come back and you might, and you try again. So that was it. And then it was um, going to see my parents to tell them that I was moving abroad. <laughs> <laughs> How did they take it? Uh, not well initially. Oh no! <laughs> um, but they 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 knew obviously the the, the plan and um, the process of what I've gone through to get where where I've gone so far, and then they kind of just understood and um, they they're used to it now. Now there is a familiar face or a familiar name when it comes to Coach Simon coming to Asia, and that is Coach Chris, our very own Chris Nathan from. Little League Soccer, he, you contacted him or somehow you connected with him on social media to get yourself here in Malaysia in the first place, is it? Is, 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 am, am, I, am I wrong? Or? No, it was on, uh, I think it was on Twitter that we connected initially. Um, and we were talking, like I say, just talking about football, coaching, and then he gave me the, the details for the, the opportunity that was coming up. See, that's very interesting because if I were to go on Twitter right now and I see a foreigner's name, uh, on my uh, on on my timeline or who follows me, he they're most probably ad accounts or bot accounts, right? So, <laughs> so to go through that barrier, that, I, I <laughs> that that is because you're a fundamental racist, Harry. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But like as a Seems general like start it. to it. Anyways, I, th- let's not let's not make it political. Um, let's not make it political in any way. Um, but. Uh, anyways, we move on to then the Middle East. How did you then set yourself up in the Middle East? Pretty similar thing. Um, mm-hmm. I got talking to our uh, current technical director, Gaz. Uh, we started chatting on LinkedIn and messaging back and forth. Um, and that, and again, it just it was um, a discussion about where he was at, what he was doing, and he was obviously on his way to Malaysia at the time. Um, mm. I was on, you know, I was leaving. And looking around for a different opportunity, and he happened to mention um, the academy in Kuwait. Um, so once I once I left my and went back to the UK, I actually met up with Gaz in the UK, and we we went out for for lunch and had a face to face chat about it, and that's basically how I uh, ended up in Kuwait. How long so, were you in? Uh, so how long were you in? Whoa, 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 oh, sorry. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just to summarize Sorry. here, right? So what, what we've learned so far is mm-hmm. uh, Simon contacted Chris in Malaysia. Yep. And Chris eventually brought him out to Malaysia through his through his contacts there. Once Simon arrives at the academy, Chris leaves. Right? Then Simon <laughs> gets in contact with Gaz in Q8. <laughs> goes to Q8. Gaz leaves. <laughs> Andy, so I'm very scared about this. Well, I'm very scared about this. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who it was that initially made contact with Simon. (laughs) Oh, you're right. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I did not see it going that way. (laughs) (laughs) So, so, um, then where, where were you in the middle? Where were you in Malaysia at first? And then where were you in the middle East? Uh, if you're, if you're comfortable in sharing where you were, um, you, you mean who I worked for in, yep, in Malaysia? Yep, in Malaysia? I worked yep. for the, the Gold Academy um, mm. in Malaysia for the, for two years. Um, so that was my like first full time full time post abroad. Um, I learned a lot in my time there. It was like um, I pretty much remember like from day one. It was pretty much sink or swim. It was, I was thrown into it straight away. Um, given two teams to look after. Um, 
you know, so I, I had to learn pretty fast. Mm. Um, and I enjoyed it. Um, but it just, it just came to a point where I felt um, there were other things being, being put in front of development. So I, I decided to, to leave and, and look somewhere else. Uh, then where in is, is it was in Kuwait that you got started again? Yeah, uh, in the Middle it East. was um, Premier Sports Academy in Kuwait were just changing from um, Everton. Uh, they've been affiliated with Everton for quite a long time, and just as I was getting there, they were changing over to Celtic mm. at, at the t- at the time. Now, uh, then this is your second stint in Malaysia. Mm. Um, what made you decide to come back? Who was it in social media this time that you were talking to? <laughs> <laughs> and what who, made you like solidify was, your decision? Who was it in social media that I'm expecting a resignation form from in the next few days? <laughs> Shall I not mention names this time or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, it was um, it was talking to Gaz again. Basically, um, mm. we had a we had a discussion of, and. Um, about what he'd been doing in Malaysia during his time. We kept in touch ever since um, the first time. And um, I've been at, um, in the King Kuwait for two years. Um, the first year I was just coaching, and then the second year I was um, running the academy. Me and another guy, we were jointly running. A lot of experience from that. Um, but after the, after the initial second year running the academy, I, I found that I was like, more off the field than on it. Um, so I, I really had a desire to get back on the field a lot more because um, that's that's where my that's where my passion lies for being on the field with the players. So I did, you know I decided I, I wanted to move and um, obviously talking to Gaz um, about the, the setup here uh, and what they were looking to do. And obviously I've worked in Malaysia before, so it was no I was no stranger to it. So it felt like a a good opportunity and then obviously I spoke to Andy um, I'm not sure if I interrupted his holiday or not at the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was oh no, no no I was I was in Singapore I think at the time no where was uh, I? I can't remember I remember I was away somewhere yeah you're right yeah so uh, I waited a couple of days spoke to Andy uh, really really liked the conversation and then uh, that's how it that's how it started hmm. I think um, Simon's hit on a couple of interesting points there I think um, firstly, that that point that he's alluded to there about coaches getting frustrated with doing more work off the pitch than than on the pitch, and I think that that's uh, a common trend you see a lot throughout um, coaching in private academies in Southeast Asia. Um, as academies grow, and inevitably, as you become a more experienced coach, there's going to be um, things that you can offer to the management or the owners of that club that are valuable off of the pitch. And it can be very easy to to take more time of, of those more experienced coaches off of the pitch than put, put them on the pitch. And I think that's something that I try to avoid as much as possible. And I try to employ a, a team of, of staff that can handle the majority of of the the work off the field and let the coaches go and coach you know coaching is a a highly skilled profession there's very few people that can be a a good coach in my opinion Um, so when you find people that are good at coaching i think it's very important to let them spend as much time as they can coaching and it's inevitable that there has to be a little bit of admin and paperwork to be done off of the pitch but we try to put into place a a system which protects our coaches from from doing um, as little as that as possible and and spending the majority of their time out on the pitch i think that's really important and it's something that a lot of coaches i find complain about like if they if they have to do more work than they they need to off of the pitch and i totally understand that Right. There's a there's a reason why Simon gave up his engineering job to go into football. He wants to be on a football pitch, right? Yep. If you don't, want, yeah. if you want to be in a in a in an office somewhere doing paperwork, you, you don't need to be a football coach, right? So it's. Yep. I think that's an interesting point. And I think that the other thing that he hit upon is um, about how and actually, to be honest, Henry, you alluded to this as well about how difficult it is for for people outside of the country to get jobs. You know, it's it's. Yep. it's it can be difficult networking and interesting fact for you simon is actually the first person i've ever employed from outside of the country um I, i've employed a lot of foreigners and stuff in my time but they have always been in malaysia where i've been able right. to sit, sit down have a discussion with them um some something else has brought them to malaysia be it their um 
their their spouse working somewhere or, or whatever it may be. They've always been in the country for some other reason. Perhaps they're at a different academy or something like that. But Simon's actually the first person I ever um, spoke to who was outside of the country and, and brought into the country. And um, process went smoothly. Uh, no issues with it whatsoever. Um, so it's, it's kind of opened my eyes. And we're now looking at uh, we've just brought a second person um, over from from the UK as well to join us, and I think that we'll probably have more in the in the future. So yep. it's it's been an interesting experience for me as well. And uh, thankfully, Simon wasn't an idiot and gave me a good uh, experience <laughs> of the first time I did it. <laughs> That's always good to know. <laughs> yeah. So um, now we're gonna before I I move on to the next segment. Um, you have very. You, to me, you have a vast experience in working abroad. Andy, you can chip into this as well. But how do trainees perceive you during your time being a foreign coach? How do they see you? The what players? They, yeah. Probably better off asking them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the big things is always when I'm, when I'm new to an academy is always the players will comment on my birthmark straight away. Right. <laughs> That's the very first thing. Um, especially the younger ones. Um, I'm used to it, you know, um, but that, that is one of the always the first things when I'm new to academy that gets mentioned by the kids straight away. But that doesn't um, affect whether you're a foreigner in a country like that. Yeah, yeah. If you're in the no, UK, and no. it'd probably be worse in the UK, right? But Yeah. Um, so so what, what kind of, I think what Henry's getting at is like, what, what's the differences of being a foreigner in Malaysia coaching? Yeah, thanks. Yep. I think I found, it, when I was here the first time, I found uh, there, was, there was a big respect for, for foreign cultures um, and in, English ones as well because um, I think coming from both the players and the parents, I think they see that um, they understand the process that you've maybe gone through in your qualification pro process and how you've been coach educated and the way that you speak to the players um, I think comes across quite well to the to the players and the parents, um, and I think they see that and have a big respect for it in the way that we conduct ourselves and the way that we've been through that process. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I I have quite strong views on this as well because you know I've obviously been working in this in this field in Malaysia for like eighteen years now, so I, I've seen this firsthand, and um, you know that. It's very easy, rightly or wrongly, it's very easy for uh, a foreigner, especially from the UK, to get immediate respect, or, or Europe, sorry, I should say Europe, uh, from Europe, to get immediate respect from kids, but also parents. Um, they see uh, a European, uh, must know about football, must know what they're talking about, must have good qualifications, traveled halfway across the world to, to, to be here. And there's some truth to that, but there's also a lot of prejudice that goes into that as well. You know, um, So I would say that it's, it's very easy for a European coach to get that initial respect. But what I would say is that all coaches have to deliver a product at the end of the day. It doesn't matter where you're from, right? And, yep. and players will quickly start to see through any gaps in your knowledge and, and holes. And this goes back to what we were saying about uh, Kesh last week with female coaches. You know, at the end of the day, if you're delivering good quality material to your players, they're going to respect you. They're going to listen to you um, and, and they, will, they will ultimately get better. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from that or, or who you are. Um, but I, I do think that that European coaches coming into Malaysia have a an unfair ad advantage in a way over the the local coaches, and um, that's a fact of life, unfortunately. Uh, but you should also not look past the fact as well that these guys, if they are in Malaysia, they have made a, a conscious decision most of the time to to come halfway across the world to teach their profession. So that should highlight some seriousness from them as well. Um, but it's. You should you should never judge a book by its cover, right? Uh, yeah, you yeah. always have to get you always have to get to know who the coach is and what they're about. And again, this is part of the reason why we're doing this podcast. We want to give an insight to to our customers and to people who might want to join our academy, who our coaches are, what they're doing, what their beliefs are, what their philosophies are. Um, and I think that it's very difficult to do that other than over a platform like this, which is why yeah. 
why yeah. we decided to start it and yep. too too many people will have a, a, a set opinion of a coach because of either how they look or where they're from and i think that that's something that we need to try and get past yep speaking of getting past that as well um we talk about this word a lot in the past two three months given the pandemic situation and anywhere in general right now but the topic of the episode this week is about adapting for coaches so Simon, you have had a lot of experience in terms of managing a a football academy, being part of a club affiliated, a professional club affiliated academy. You're now in a private academy. There's a lot of things that you have to um, adapt to. So we're going to talk more about that this episode. So Simon, now to start things off, right? When you worked in these few academies affiliated to pro clubs like Everton, Celtic, Rotherham, um, as compared to a private academy, how different is the system? Um, I think from private academies to obviously to uh, pro clubs, obviously the the obvious one is that you know professional clubs have the have the first team um, sort of carrot at the end of the end of the road for for players. Um, and it's a little bit different as well, just on the experience I had was with younger groups at, at, at Rotherham United. It was like, um, basically, the coaches um, were building an under eight team to be able to step up to the under nines, to be an under nines academy team at, 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 the, at the club. So there was there's players coming in and out on trial all the time that the scouts have been to watch. And so they're trying to build this team to build a squad to step up to the under nines, um, private academies, as you know, is is, is, diff- is different. They're, they're they're coming in from the local area, whereas in the pro club they would come from all different um, different towns and all around. The scouts were going all over the place, um, so there's that little element to it. Okay, um, Simon, sorry, I I think I, I didn't mention this before, uh, but I feel like mentioning it right now. But Simon, you're a lefty. Yes. Right. You're very, a lefty. Very proud of that and, fact too. And and and, <laughs> and and I was made um aware or I, I that this is quite sought after in football. But that uh, that being a player, having a left footed player is quite quite um like an asset to a football team. Now that being said, let's go into coaching. Was it hard for you to adapt to a predominantly right handed or right footed um uh environment when when you were coaching how did you like how how did you overcome it (laughs) sorry i can't use my right foot (laughs) yeah i I know i know but like do you know how like when you are in the dominant your dominant hand you always think about okay my right hand uh you're always dominant in that one so you always start off instinctively with that but you know when you're coaching younger kids they may use that as like uh you know oh i start with my left foot but by right you're actually telling them to start with your dominant foot you know, they don't understand that. So what did you have to do to kind of adapt to that? Yeah, I mean, I do. You obviously, you, you always kind of go to your dominant foot when I'm doing demonstrations. It's just natural for me to use my left foot straight away. But it's sometimes the, the players will remind you and go, but coach, I'm using my right foot. Like, okay, well, I'll use my right foot then. So, I'll, and I'll change and use it. Um, and I always have to try and be conscious of that as well. Because if you're looking, if the players are looking at you at a certain angle and they're using your left foot, sometimes... They might not understand it, whereas if you show them on their, you know, on the right foot, then they will. Um, so I am, I am conscious of that as well at, at times, and the players do point it out to me at times and say, "Well," and I switch and use the other foot. Was yeah, it a struggle I, for you at the start? Sorry, Andy. Not. I, would, I would say it's, I wouldn't say struggle. Not really. Yeah. No. I, I like for me, this is a very interesting subject because. Obviously, there's there's more right-footed players out there than there is left-footed players, which inevitably means that there's more right-footed coaches than there is left-footed coaches. And um, you see it very often, especially with inexperienced coaches, that they'll they'll run a drill geared up to a right-footed player um, and then forget to reverse it to either practice on your left foot or for left-footed players to get a chance on their stronger foot. They often forget that. Um, do you think that being a left-footed coach, you would have that same mentality, or did you, when you were uh, were less experienced, that you would set up a drill that was, in, you know, favouring the left side, and then how do those right-footed players respond to a drill being set up for a left-footed player? Did you ever experience any of that? Um, 
I wouldn't, I don't think I would say I'd ever set up something specifically for just, for just left footed. I think, um, I think obviously when, when we, when you're coaching, you want the players to be able to use both feet as much as possible in anything that you do. But I don't think I've ever set one up specifically for one side. Um, but I think, like I mentioned earlier, when, when you are doing demonstrations, you always kind of just go to your dominant foot naturally straight away. And then you have to kind of be, remind yourself that, hang on a minute, most of these guys are right footed. So mm. they're looking at me a little bit strange right now. Do I need to change my foot <laughs> and, show them, and show them the other foot? Because they, they're looking going, mm, I, I don't, if you go on your other foot, then I'll understand it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you wouldn't say that it's, it's something that you've had to specifically plan for. Your I would, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say no. Okay. Well then, we uh, we well, will talk. Finally, sorry. finally on the left footed thing. How do you think it affected your playing career, if at all? Oh, oh. wow, it's been, it did when I was younger. Because when I first started out, I used to play central midfield, um, and then when I got into, I remember a junior team because I was left footed and they had no left back. I was immediately put to left back, <laughs> and I pretty much I stayed. Think- Stayed there for the rest of my career. <laughs> you know, uh, the f- we, we organized a few coaches' matches occasionally. And uh, the first coaches' match that I ever organized found out Simon was a left foot. So I think I did the same thing, put you at left back. Yeah. Or, or, <laughs> or at least it was left center back left because center we had back, yeah. Nazrin, who was also a, a left footed player. So he went left back and you went left center back. <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it kind of, I kind of got put in a pigeonhole straight away from being a youngster into left back um, because, like you say, there isn't too many. Well, you know, left footers around. So you're quite lucky if you get a team with a lot of left footed players. Hmm. So we've, we've, we're done with the um, left foot topic. Uh, we let's talk structure now. Let's talk about structure. We go back into coaching. Um, we look at Little League and its transition to FC Kuala Lumpur, right? Uh, that's our, F, uh, our elite setup. So over the years, we've had a lot of expansions and now we have the Elite Development, development Program, uh, which allows for potential players, potential elite players who have not achieved that level yet to gain some experience before actually transitioning into the elite setup. Yeah. Now, being that uh, development squad coach in Rotherham, how important do you think it's uh, to have something like elite, an elite development in the grassroots, I think it's um, I think it's a great thing to have because, like you say, they they get that opportunity to get experience sometimes in a in a lesser pressurized environment. Um, and obviously, the way that the way that we're set up, where we have little league and the EDP and then the FCKL, it's that in between stage. If they've come from little league to go into that little, little opportunity, gain experience. Um, and potentially have the opportunity then to move up to FCKL. So I think it's really important in their development because if you didn't have it, there would be a big gap in between. Um, and it would be a real struggle for a player to come out of the lower end part of the development stage and then to jump up. And that gap is quite big. Yeah, I think f- for me, this is something that is crucial in a development academy. If your goal is to develop football players, you have to have different levels that they're able to play at. And right. too often, parents in particular, so sometimes kids, parents in particular get caught up on, oh, my kid is not in the FCKL team. He's only playing for EDP or only playing for Little League, whatever it may be. Coaches are not going to do that because they have whole grudges or anything against kids. They're going to do it because they think that that's where that kid is best suited. You know, there is no point picking a player in your in your first team if they are not at that level. You're far better off putting them in the second tier of team where they are comfortable, relaxed, can enjoy their football. They're going to develop so much better than if they are like the 16th best player in a 15 man squad. If they are in that position, they're going to have a horrible time. You know, okay, they get to say that they're in the first team squad, but you're not going to develop as a player. You're not going to enjoy your football. You're going to fall out of love with the game. And in a couple of years, you're not going to play anymore. So too too many people get caught up on being in that first, second, third, fourth. It it, it does not matter. As long as you're in the correct um, tier, then you should just enjoy your football and get on. And, And kids, as we know, all develop at various different rates and speeds. And just because you're in the first, first tier when you're eight does not mean you're going to be there when you're 16 or vice versa Mm. you you know there's plenty of examples of players who were who were rubbish at the age of eight or nine and then they blossom late and by the time they're 16 17 they're the best player in the team 
there's loads of examples of that in professional football in private academies in in development teams it doesn't matter right kids develop at all different rates so for me it's it's so important that we have those three different tiers and people should try to be very um open-minded about assessing the situation is your kid in the right level for them forget about every other factor forget about telling your friends that your son is or your daughter is in the first team forget about that are they in the right tier if they're in the right tier they're going to get better at football and they're going to enjoy it most importantly and that's what we're trying to achieve with the the development program is like simon said to bridge that gap between the little league development sessions the fckl first team but it shouldn't end there you know in 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 12 to 18 months time i expect to have another program that fits somewhere in between little league and the development program you know it's 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 never ending it's about creating right. as many tiers as we can for however many uh, kids that we have there should always be that gradual step up available to them i think it's also uh, safe to say that this is a way for us to help kids adapt to different 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 uh, skill sets so that they are more equipped when they get into the elite uh, that being said um, we go into again the coaching aspect simon <coughs> how tough was it for you to adapt to this three system so far which was development elite development and then elite and what did you do to adapt to these three different environments because you're involved really really um hands-on with these three development sessions or three environments now i think um the experience that i or the process what i I would say that i've gone through before because when i started out coaching i was um, volunteering at grassroots junior football so very mixed ability of players um then obviously working with Rotherham, you're working with higher level players. Um, and then obviously when I was in Malaysia and Kuwait, you're working with, you're working with both. So you're working with the, the grassroots side of it and then you're working with the elite side of it. So I think the process that I've gone through enabled me to be able to deal with all three of our current structure of what we've got. So I think I, the experience I had previously prepared me quite well for what we've got currently. Did you have to prepare yourself three personas to kind of adapt yourself into each setting? I don't, I wouldn't say um, personas. I, I don't think you have to change your persona across the three different um, tiers. I think it's what you deliver and the way and how you deliver it to suit right. the player's ability. Right. I think you certainly have to change uh, things like terminology, you know, like, you know, you're explaining uh, a technical um, point to say Simon's under 14s first team FCKL players versus under 10s at Little League on a Saturday morning is very different the kind of language and terminology you're going to use um, right but I think that you know what Simon's referring to there is where he, he learned his his basics at the grassroots level you know he first mm-hmm. started coaching with grassroots players and this is a trap that I think a lot of um, ex-professional players fall into is they, they they fall out of the game or they retire from the game whatever it may be they come into coaching because that's what they know to do and they want a first team straight away you know or, right, or, yeah. or they, they want you know the, they want not not necessarily the first team of the academy but maybe like uh an under 12 first team you know that's not yeah. the way you learn how to coach you know you have to go to the grassroots you have to do your times with the four five six year olds start to learn the basics work your way up um, then you start to deal with the development sessions for the eights nines and tens and then you can start to start uh, branching out into uh, teams that you're going to take into a league match. And uh, a lot of coaches try to rush that process a bit too much, I think. And then a lot of coaches as well, once they do get to that level where they are teaching a first team, forget about the grassroots stuff and they never go back and do any any coaching with grassroots things. I think that's a mistake as well. Um, mm-hmm. And all of our coaches, they all coach Saturday, Sunday morning with the Little League um, development mm-hmm. sessions. And that for me is crucial for coaches because it, it makes you um, go back to basics every single weekend. You're going back to basics and you're, and you're teaching um, those fundamentals of football. I think that's so important for coaches to keep on top of. Right. Um, speaking of going back to basics as well, so we, I, I, th- I think we have, made, we, we have made it very aware to our listeners that we have a girls squad playing in the Air Asia KL Girls League. Um, and we've got Simon coaching the under-13s girls this year. Now, how different is the environment as compared to coaching boys, Simon? Um, well, this, I've, I coached girls before 
this, but it was only like individuals within a within a boys team. Um, so this is like the first time that I've actually took a, a full girls team together. Um, the first experience that I had like before I took over the team, I was lucky enough to take care of them when we were in the Penang tournament a little bit and look after them. And the, and the biggest thing that struck me was when I watched them play was their work rate was incredible. Um, and that's not to be detrimental to them that, that, that though they can't do it. It was just that when I watched them, they, they never stopped running for each other. It was fantastic to watch. Um, and then so when I got the opportunity to take the, the girls team, I was quite excited about it. Um, a new challenge, a different challenge to coach girls. Um, the environment is, is really good. The girls are very, very attentive and they listen to, to, to what they're being coached. Um, they're great fun to be around. There's some real characters in that team for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've really enjoyed it so far. I think, and the, the difference at the moment, I would say, is because the, the boys team is 11 v 11 and the girls is currently 5 v 5. So you have to slightly focus on different aspects in, in training as well. So there's, there's kind of a little different aspect to it on that as well. Right. Would you say the the team camaraderie is is stronger amongst the girls than the boys? Mm, good question. Yeah, some yeah sometimes I do notice that. Yeah, yeah, I would I would say so at times. Yeah, I, I think that that has a lot to do with that. You know, uh, a lot of boys are expected to play football, uh, especially if the the, the the dads have been involved in football from from youth and stuff i think a lot of boys get thrown into football is kind of expected and they you know they carry it on as maybe they're good at it and they just carry on playing whereas there's very few girls that are being forced to go and play football or not forced i shouldn't say forced i don't think boys are being forced but there's very few girls that are being taken to football unless they express a uh, specific interest and yeah. when they uh, express a specific interest they're going to be 100 percent committed to it and then uh they want to play with their friends you know they want to play with their friends so they bring their friends down and a lot of these a lot of the girls are are going to be friends outside of the football setting whereas perhaps the boys are not perhaps the boys are they're a team on the pitch um but maybe they're not such a tight group of friends off of the pitch as well so i've always found that dynamic of girls teams very interesting and i i think that they definitely have a stronger bond than the the boys do boys teams do in general now that being said uh Simon uh we're going to I'm going to ask you another question about adaptation with the girls team but um I'm going to show you a video that I caught during the uh Air Asia KL Junior League and that was you giving a team talk okay uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> So right now what I'm going to do is I am going to share my screen with you guys Okay um hold on let me just open that file up for so make, you don't see anything make, else in my yeah, background make, first. Make sure you got the right window open. Yeah, it? exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so here we go. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen with you right now. Enjoy that. Why not? You played really, really you well. Did, you played you guys. really well. You should not be disappointed after that today. I know it was one 0 yeah, yeah. but I'm absolutely really proud again. You did a fantastic performance again for you. All right, and I think the gap between us and JSA now is really small. Okay, so I thought you did fantastic as well. Really proud of you. Okay, just that little technique we need to work on in shielding, protecting the ball, getting our body in between, being a little bit stronger. And I think we'll be fine. No problems at all. Come on, girls, over get Stand up. And uh, so, my next question is, these girls are only seeing competitive football for, what, less than a year? Right, what was your process there? What was what was going through your mind at that point of time when you were giving the girls the team talk? Because, um, and how is it different? What does it take to motivate these players who have just found competitive football? On that particular clip, um, the game was very close, but and like I said, the work rate from the girls has, has always been great, and I think that I've never really had to. Uh, and as a coach. You know, one of the things you would look for in your team is that hard work and determination when they're on the pitch. And the girls have that in abundance. Um, what what um, I was just touching on there was the te technical part of it because it's 5v5, so they, they see the ball a lot. But the individual 1v1 battle sometimes and that technique of being able to shift the ball or shield it or protect it or whatever it might be, 
that's been my focus within the training sessions for the girls to be able to deal with the ball under pressure um, because it's a small pitch, it's 5v5, so they see a lot of the ball and they're always under pressure at some point in the game. Um, so that was that was my kind of focus. I think in terms of motivating players that have just come into that kind of scenario, I don't, I don't think I have to motivate them too much for it. They want to play football, they enjoy playing it, um, they enjoy the competitive side of it, um, they're enjoying the training sessions. And I think also when when they're a little bit older, they they should have that self-motivation in their locker as well as a player. I don't think it always always comes from the coach. Um, part of your makeup as a football player is to have that self-determination and self-motivation as well. Right. Now, obviously, there your message to the girls, like you said, is is all about the the technical aspects and trying to work on that in training and like you said it's 5v5 so it's it's not a lot of tactics it's it's more about those individual skills and and touching the ball a lot of times in a match yeah. that couldn't be more different for your under 14 boys that are playing 11 aside so how does your message to them differ and how does uh, it affect your brain having to uh, transition between the two especially on days such as tuesdays and thursdays where you're doing a girls session first and then immediately going into the boys session straight after yeah it is it's it's challenging to do it um, as you say the boys being 11 v 11 it's completely different training sessions because they're more tactical um, focused than the girls the girls have been a lot more just technique based so a lot of time spent working with the ball on both feet in different scenarios that we that i can put them into and then like you say i have to switch once i go to the boys and it becomes working on a bigger part of the field more tactical awareness um it has been challenging but i think um I've, I've experienced it a little bit as well in in kuwait because i was working with a younger age group and an older age group so it was not not a girls group but the the younger age group so it was i was working i've had that slight experience with working with a younger age group in a smaller setting smaller pitch and working with an 11 v 11 team as well so i'm, I'm used to it and how do your your team talks differ to the boys um, <laughs> compared to those girls in that situation? Um, they differ, yeah, quite a lot, I would say. Um, the, the what I try and do with the boys um, is that a lot of work is done in the week when we're when we're training and the messages that you want to get across. When it comes to the team talks um, at the weekend, it's just reminding them of those points, but. You want, what you want from well, what I want from the older boys is to have that self awareness and that problem solving skill. So when they cross that white line on a Saturday or Sunday, it's right. What have you learned in training? Can you can you show me that you've learned it? If you can't, and there's a problem on the pitch, it shouldn't be a case of just looking and turning at the coach and expecting him to solve the problem for you. Solve the problem on the pitch. Then when it comes at half time, we can discuss it, and you can tell me if you if you've solved it or what can we do to change it. I'm very much, I want to question and answer. I want a lot of answers from the players instead of just me talking constantly. Um, and it's the same with the girls, but just in a little bit, I guess in a different way. It's a different format. So we talk more towards like the technical aspect and what we've worked on in training in that regard and how can you implement it within the game. Um, so I, that kind of um, team talks I, I use at the weekends for different groups. Last question from me with this segment is, You've asked our coaches this question twice now, so we would like to answer this question. We wanted you to we wanted to hear your answer this time. Um, what would you like to achieve for the future of Little League? Um, I think if we can, if it can keep growing and developing, and maybe to to wider areas as well. Um, if we can take football to areas that may not have uh, much access to it, if that's possible to do. Um, maybe it will be, maybe it won't. Well, I guess we'll have to see. Um, I think that what we provide with Little League with, and the coaches that we've got and it, it's fantastic. And I enjoy coaching at the weekend and Little League. I think it, it, it's great fun. And, the, and there's some, uh, the particular groups that I have, I've run the 10s at UM and there's some absolute crazy characters in that group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's great to coach because I think Andy touched on it earlier that you different aspects of coaching a first team and going to coach at the weekend. Um, it, it's great. And I just hope that we can, like I said, um, spread it further if, if that's possible. 
that that wraps up really nicely. Uh, Andy, do you have anything to kind of wrap it up from your side? No, I mean like it's similar sort of message uh, to what uh, me and May spoke about on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago. It's that mm-hmm. football is about everybody being involved. You know, there's very few people that ever um, reach a high level of football, um, and that doesn't even have to be professional football. You know, like if you look at just just within our organization, I, I had worked it out for somebody that was questioning me about FCK on the team selections that. If you're in one of our um, development programs, that means elite development or or the first team, the top two tiers of it, uh, you're in like the top 22% of our organization as a football player. That's a crazy stat, you know, just for just for a private football youth organization. If you're representing our our top teams, our two top tiers, you're in the top 22% of the club. Now, if you multiply that across the rest of the country and people don't have access to to our little league sessions, maybe we're not near to them or they're they're training somewhere else. It's even fewer people who are representing our FCKO uh, teams. So the goal the goal for me is to to get spread that base as wide as possible and and get as many people involved in our setup as as possible and just give people access to to good quality coaching and, and give them the opportunity to take their football as far as they can for everybody that's going to be completely different depending on who they are that really wraps everything up nicely in terms of our topic this week Uh, that being said we are going to go into our final segment which is ask soccer 60 where we will take your questions for andy and simon andy and simon do not know what the questions are only i do this is my favorite part of the whole (laughs) podcast Um, simon simon (laughs) has asked a question every week so far has he asked himself a question (laughs) Uh, no, unfortunately. But if you guys do have any other questions for future guests, do not hesitate to send them over on our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. Without any further ado, first question will be from our coaches. Just you know, to honor uh, Simon for sending in so many questions every week. So, first question from the coaches is from Tiru Senten. If you were offered a lucrative professional contract to play for a veterans team, would you choose coaching or choose the contract? <laughs> That's easy. I'd just keep coaching. I'm too unfit to play. <laughs> You're too what, sorry? <laughs> too unfit. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my time playing. <laughs> okay. Uh, Andy, what would, what would have been your decision? Oh, uh, coaching all day long. Um, you know, I, I mentioned previously that, that the playing path wasn't for me, you know, and um, it, it didn't work out for its own reasons. But that led me into this this job that I'm in now. And, you know, it's not even really a job for me now anymore. It's it's just life. Right. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so hands down, I pick pick coaching. And um, next question will be from this Player, I think one of our players uh, who has been trying to ask us a question for um, quite a while now, but we finally selected it because uh, it's finally appropriate to the rundown, uh, is that from Dominic W, so I think it's one of the under-16 EDP players, what attribute do you look for the most in young players in terms of work ethic, talent, passion, ability? What was it that you're looking for? I don't think it's just one thing. I think you look at a number of things for a youth player. Um, it might be work rate, determination, what's their character like? Are they a good team player? Um, so it's not always how good they are and how skillful they are. Because, um, you know, most of the time you can see that. What are the other parts? What's their character like? Um, do they, or are they always turning up for training? So the other aspects of it, you know, are they a humble person? Are they an arrogant player? You know, all these type of things you look for in a player, and it's not just about the skill part. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. Obviously, I think um, you know, a, a, a lot of people will say that um, you know the mental characteristics are, are far more important. But I also think you have to take into account what age group you're looking at. You know, like when you get to um, the older age groups playing eleven aside. Um, just being a naturally gifted player is no longer good enough. You have to be yep. able to think about the game. You have to be able to put in the work rate when you need to for your team. It's a lot more required than, say, when you're eight years old. That mentality doesn't really come into it as much. You know, mm-hmm. if you're the best, if you're the best player at eight years old, you're going to be on. The, you're going to be the best player on that pitch 
um, regardless of what your mental work rate is, likely. Um, whereas when you get older, it's, it's far more important to have that footballing brain and that mentality um, rather than just the natural skills. So I think you should also consider, you know, what, what stage of development you're at as well when you answer that question. Right. Um, next question will be, and Andy, I, I will let you ask that question. You put it. I, I think you try to convince us to put it in to Little oh, League Soccer. So, Andy, why don't you ask that question? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll ask my question and then I'll put in the little uh, correction that Ian, my brother, asked me. <laughs> so, my question was, what is it like teaching players that are taller than you? And <laughs> Ian corrected it to what's it like teaching a 10-year-old that's taller than you? <laughs> wow, I, I thought I might escape getting through this without talking about my height. Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's, it's been having a very sore neck for many years by looking up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so regular neck massages. <laughs> in, in, to, to try... To try and put a slightly semi-serious point on this question, <laughs> is there any um, is there any issue with it when you're teaching the under 14s? Like most of them are going to be taller than you, just <laughs> just a fact, right? Uh, is there any kind of issue? Do the do the players mention it all? Or? No, not really. They haven't not mentioned it yet. I don't know why. Uh, I'll have to have a word with them. <laughs> yeah, maybe they'll tell you. <laughs> they're, miss, they're missing out on something there. <laughs> Final question uh, from the Instagram page is at what uh, from Kurt Hurt. At what age or stage of development do you feel tactical training is okay? I think like um, the tactical training probably comes when they're hitting maybe like 12, 13, 14, just to start to introduce them. Obviously, when they get to 13, 14, they're stepping up and going. Um, 14 into 11 v 11 so i think like from 12 if you start to make them aware of it um you could you can teach them start of the the starting aspects of it obviously when it gets to 11 v 11 it comes with comes more in depth um for me okay i i i think um tactical is a very wide-ranging term right it can mean a lot of things like if you're asking about ta tactical, I would even you could even take it down to the under eights who are playing in the league for the first time. Things like uh, if you are winning one nil and you're in a tight game and the ball goes out of play, do you run to get it or do you take your time to walk across it? Like yeah. that's a controversial subject as to whether we should be teaching kids to do that, right? But at the end of the day, if you're in a competitive scenario, you know you got to you got to think about things like that. Now, if right. you want to talk about tactical uh, side of the game in terms of uh, positions, formations, things, um, you know, when to counterattack, when to sit back, or whatever it may be. Uh, you can see that, I think, throughout the age groups when the, the playing formats change, you know. So if you look at what we do in the, the Air Asia Junior League, uh, they're playing seven aside up to the age of 10. Then when they go to 11, they play nine aside. There should be a there should be a discussion about tactics there, as far as I'm concerned, because mm -hmm. going from playing seven aside to nine aside is a big difference, um, and the whole point of that is to have a stepping stone to prepare you to play eleven aside. So there should be a slight shift in mentality then, I think, and then mm -hmm. obviously when you turn from twelve to thirteen and you start playing eleven aside, and don't forget our age groups work in the way that you're going to be under thirteen playing in an under fourteen league division. So there has to be a mention of tactics then um, because you're going to be playing against bigger, older, stronger kids than you are. Um, so there has to be tactics to come into there. So for me, it's, it should be a gradual thing that it's not all of a sudden you're 13 years old and whack, we start talking about tactics. I think mm. it needs to be introduced as you go throughout your, your academy journey. Right. Um, Simon, just a follow-up to Andy's question before we end it. Um, you had a chance to get to know or work with the under 14s your current under 14s when they were playing in the under 13s league or more like the b division of the u 14s division league um was it hard to transition from the 13s tactics to the 14s tactics or was it almost similar i think it like i it's, it was a little bit different scenario because when they're when they're 13s and they're playing in an under 14s league that you know it is quite tough because they're a year younger and they play they might be a more de playing against more developed players. I think in terms of like um, tactics and things like that, I wouldn't say there was too much of a shift. 
obviously I might have tinkered with the formation slightly and how we play and the process of how we play. Um, but it's funny that you mentioned that as well because um, we did a we did a Zoom meeting with the with the boys and I invited um, Gaz and two of his players to speak to my players um, to talk about their experiences of what they experienced being an under 15s team in an under 16s league because obviously my under 14s next year will be stepping up to that process so I wanted to give them an insight into it and to, to hear from players that have been through that journey to try and give them an insight and prepare them to what they might face and what challenges they might face. Hmm. That is actually a very good way to kind of um, get them prepared and that being said all the best in terms of when football comes back and uh, how it is in the future for you, Simon. And that brings us to the end of the podcast. So thank you again, Simon, for joining us today. Um, don't forget to give us feedback. Send us some of your questions. We'd love to hear from you guys. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting platforms. Leave us a five-star rating there. If it's not a five-star rating, don't forget to comment on that platform as well and let us know what we can improve on. Um, most importantly, don't forget to follow us on Little Leaks. Soccer Malaysia on our social media platforms at Little League Soccer MY on Facebook and Instagram. Next week, we have Co uh, Coach Chris Nathan. So stay tuned for that and we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>